Hey, this is Brett Lindenberg, founder of Food Empire Pro. Today, we're speaking with Eric Silverstein, founder of Austin's The Peach Tortilla Restaurant, who's releasing a new cookbook called The Peach Tortilla, Modern Asian Comfort Food from Tokyo to Texas. For readers not familiar with The Peach Tortilla, here's a quick recap. Eric left a promising career as a lawyer to start The Peach Tortilla in 2010 with a rented food truck. Fast forward nearly a decade, and the brand has grown from a single mobile food unit to one of the most recognized food brands in Austin. Now, there's a little bit of something for everyone in this episode of Food Empire Pro. Eric digs into the process he took to create the new cookbook, how to manage a growing family while running a food business, and also how to start a food brand in your market from literally nothing to going to one of the most recognized brands in your area. By the way, you can win a free copy of the Peach Tortilla's new book to celebrate its launch. We're gonna be giving away 20 free copies of the book. All you need to do is share this video on Facebook for a chance to win. And we'll even give you a bonus entry if you share your favorite food to eat at the Peach Tortilla or just why you're personally excited to get your hands on the cookbook. We're gonna be selecting some of the best and most creative responses to win the free book. With that, let's dive in to today's interview. Basically, just to like run it down, you're like lawyer to food truck owner to restaurant owner, multiple locations, multiple food trucks. Now you've got a bar I saw online and I'm looking forward to uh, I'm coming to Austin for the first time, I think in October. Okay, I've got scheduled. So I'm looking forward to hitting it, hitting up the uh, the Austin airport location. (laughs) That's another. Yeah. And, And actually, we have the the 7,000 square foot hub for our catering facility and our event space, which is actually our prior biggest like operation on its own, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on. I mean, to answer your question, I never really, I never went out to write a book. It was never an intended thing. Um, I got approached by a, uh, a literary agent who went to Wash U where I went to undergrad. She liked my story and she was like, I think you should write a memoir about, transitioning careers and like all the stuff you've dealt with and I was like I don't know like all right maybe you know let's talk um it wasn't high on my list to be completely Mm -hmm. honest I was really focused on trying to grow the business and uh she was very persuasive and so I was like look I don't have time to write this book I'm gonna hire a ghostwriter so I hired a ghostwriter we wrote a pitch for a memoir pitched it for two years got no bites this is like 2012 2000 14. Oh, wow. So uh, she came back and she was like, look, publishers want cookbooks. Um, They don't want memoirs. They don't sell as well. What do you think about doing a cookbook? And I was like, man, I'm, I'm, you know, I was like, I'm out $5,000 paying this ghostwriter. Um, (laughs) I don't really have the energy to write a cookbook. Like this is a huge undertaking. Mm hmm. Um, and she, again, she was very persuasive. She thought we could get a deal. So then I said, fine, let's put a proposal together, circulated it for another year and a half and finally got two offers. Um, and we took one of the offers, which is with Sterling publishing. And, you know, I told her, I was like, Hey, if I'm going to take this offer, like, I'm not, go- I'm not getting a ghostwriter. Like I'm going to write the book. Hmm. I'm going to pick the photos. Like I'm going to choose a photographer. Like I'm going all in and we're going to go heavy on promo. And that's what we did, you know, like I was, I was basically like this book, like I'm going to have so much control over this book because honestly, as, as much as I liked my ghostwriter, it didn't fit my voice. Yeah. Um, it yeah. just wasn't me. So I was like, I'm going to write this book myself. And I included as much memoir as the publisher would allow me to. Okay. Um, a lot got taken out, but a lot got left in. So, so part memoir, part recipe book yeah i mean we have a hundred recipes so it's absolutely Mm -hmm. a cookbook first but um there is certainly story in there there's a lot of story that most people don't know um and i think you know people ask me all the time like who is this book for and it's Mm -hmm. it's for people that like peace tortilla that want to recreate recipes at home it's for people that are interested in cooking asian food um but it's also for people who just want to be inspired and who are struggling with their businesses and Hmm. you know uh you know, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of people there who are trying to take a leap or have taken a leap but are at the very early stages of starting a food business or a small business in general and this book is for them as well hmm. how how so how is it for those people that want to start a business well, I mean, I talk a lot about my trepidation, um, mm-hmm. my discontent in my prior career, uh, not being easy to switch careers, like things that challenges along the way, um, my mentality and trying to fight, combat those challenges, uh, hitting a very, very extreme low point in this business mm-hmm. um, to the point where I just didn't really want to be in, I just didn't think I had it in me to be in the, in hospitality any, anymore. Um you know, question if I could do it the the right way. Um, so there, there's a lot of that in there. And I think, I think every business owner goes through that at some point. What, uh, what kind of recipes can you expect to find in there? A lot of, well, all the recipe, a lot of the recipes in the restaurant, um, okay. a lot of our food truck recipes, so tacos, um, our Japa jam burger. Um, so some street food items, obviously, and then um, some home kind of comfort food recipes that I grew up eating, um, you know, at home with my mom's Chinese. So it's, it's a lot of Chinese inspired stuff, um, perhaps tweaked a little bit. Um, so I think I think the way the book is, it's, it's a kind of a few categories. It's kind of like there's this street food section, which is a lot of like our, our street food hits and like it's kind of mixed mash of like, you know, Asian fast food meets street food kind of deal. Um, there's mm-hmm. the, the modernized Asian food that we spit out at a restaurant. And then there's just sort of like more OG comfort food stuff that I grew up eating. And it's kind of a mix match of those three. Okay. What was the, what was like the process you used to determine the recipes that you were going to put in there? Obviously you took some yeah. from the restaurant, some from the food truck. I mean, it's a hundred recipes. It's right. a lot of recipes. <laughs> so it was less like, oh, I'm going to weed this out and more like, damn, like I need to figure okay. out like, you know, I got to get a hundred recipes in here. That's a lot of recipes. Um, you think about my menu, like might have 18 or 19 items on it. So, mm-hmm. you know, a hundred recipes, okay. a lot of recipes. Um, so it was really more about like, hey, what, what, what items and like what recipes represent me? I pulled some from a, an old food truck I had. Uh, called Yume Burger is a Japanese inspired burger truck that that didn't uh, wasn't around for very long. I used some of those recipes because I thought they were still indicative of the type of cooking that you know we're known for. Mm-hmm. Tell me about the process that you used to put all of this together. Um, like, yeah. what's what's that like? Starting trying to write a cookbook. Yeah. Right away in the beginning when there's sort of that blank yeah. page. <laughs> well, I'll add, I'll add more depth to that in the sense that we, we we signed our contract with the publishing house in November. Okay. And they were like, okay, well, if we're going to have a May 2019 pub date, then you need to get our uh, manuscript to us like end of March of 18. So that's four months, less than four months. Hmm. And so we signed the book, we signed the deal right before Thanksgiving in 2017. And I remember I had a day or two off for Thanksgiving because we closed the restaurant down. And I went to a coffee shop and started writing the book. Wow. Because I knew I didn't have any time to waste. All right. And, um, and so, you know, you, you, we had to be really focused to, to do this in four months, you know, because not only are you trying to write the memoir portion of the book, to organize it in such a way that it makes sense for the reader to create and write all the recipes, but then you got to organize all the photography behind it because mm-hmm. they, you know, the publisher wants a, a photograph for every uh, item in the book, you know. Right. So we did eight photo shoots. Um, so mm-hmm. trying to cram all that down, write the book, and then test the recipes was really challenging. So every weekend I would do like three or four recipes at home. So I would go shop for all the ingredients. And then try to execute it and tweak the recipes at home. But I mean, for four months, it was just straight cookbook, you know. I mean, I have a I have a, a quote unquote day job. I mean, I have to run the business. <laughs> so it was. Luckily, it was right before um, we opened the airport unit. Okay. So I had time to do it before I rolled into the airport unit, and then once the airport unit was done, then I rolled into the Bar Peach build out. So luckily, it kind of you know all fit on a timeline but a book is an endeavor like the way mm-hmm. i see a book is you you either go all in or, or not 
Um, you have to approach it like an investment. And, you know, it's, it's, it's your decision whether you want to hire a, a great photographer or you want to shoot the book yourself. Like the publisher doesn't dictate that. You gotcha. Know? Hmm. But your book will look like crap if you try to take photos off your iPhone for it, you know. So um, we spent more than half of our advance just on photography. Yeah. You know? Well, you, yeah, you don't have time to learn how to be t- become a photographer. No, I imagine no. on top of all that uh, that you've got going on. Uh, you mentioned the economics of launching the cookbook. Yeah. Doesn't the publisher just take care of all that and front you like, you know, well, the a quarter million so, up front or something? So what I, no. <laughs> I mean, if you're like uh, like a celebrity chef, you know, like right. your, your terms are very different. You know, sure, I'm not sure. um, I'm not on Netflix, you know, like I don't have my own show. So I'm not on Food Network. So I'm not getting the deals that like Guy Fieri and David Chang. And I hate to rope those two in together because they're nothing alike. But um I'm not getting those deals, right? I'm getting a very, what I got was a very fair deal Mm -hmm. for someone that does not have national recognition at this point in their career, right? Like we're highly local Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm very well aware of that, you know, like people in New York city don't know about me really. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when you take a deal, like you basically have a choice to make your choice is, make it as great a cookbook as possible and not make any money or try to make some money and maybe make it an okay book. Mm-hmm. Um, because your photography, you know, we had a $10,000 advance, a percentage went to my agent, a lot went to photography. So I was left with hardly sure. anything. And then we decided to pay a bunch on, on for PR to promote it. Cause I didn't want to take any rest. Like the publisher has a really good um, PR person working in house but again, I wanted to give myself the best uh, opportunity available, particularly promoting it locally in Austin and then you know nationwide. So we have three different groups promoting it from a PR standpoint to get as much PR as possible. Um, because if we don't get PR, then nobody knows the books out there. Right, right, totally. Um, how do you uh, how do you balance all this stuff? How do I balance it? Yeah, yeah, like just like your life in general because I feel like a, a lot of people that would just own a food truck, that takes a ton of time, much less like everything that you've got going on plus a buck on top of it. Yeah. And you've got a, a family too, I know. Yeah. Uh, so Yeah, like, and I have another kid coming. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two yeah. Ma- two makes it harder, trust me. Uh, I mean, it's great, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but it's like double the work. It's so weird. Um, double the work? <laughs> uh, maybe not quite Don't double. Tell me that. But, um, but yeah, like, like, how do you find time to do all this stuff, basically? Mm-hmm. How do you organize your I day? I mean, I like to stay busy. <laughs> I think you have to like to stay busy. Mm-hmm. Um, and we... You know, there, there. It's kind of the workflow kind of ebbs and flows, right? Like, as we grow, like you need to hire and you need to cover um, management positions. And when my when my plate gets too full, I realize like, hey, I need to, I need to delegate or hire somebody to help offset some of this work so I can focus on growing the business. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean I don't work a lot. I mean, I work a lot of hours. Um, but in a strange way, it is manageable. Um, but I also have a lot of people working for me. It's it's obviously not. I'm not a one man show by any means. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, the, it takes a lot of discipline too. To to write a book is very. It, it's a lot of discipline. You have to force yourself to like stick stay on a schedule, really. You know. And I think when I was doing it, I was just so focused on just trying to get it done, like. Like to give an example of how involved I was, my photographer sent me like a thousand photos, right? (laughs) And then I would pick the photos that I wanted to use in the book and then I would label the photos, insert them exactly where I wanted in the book and label them so that so that my publisher would know like which shots applied to which items. Like they they would like I would give them like ten options for like one one menu item and they would pick the one they wanted you know mm-hmm. but i would kind of dictate where 
where they would kind of go rough, roughly. And, you know, it was a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. What, uh, what piece of advice would you give to somebody that's, uh, a re- say a restaurant owner, another restaurant mm-hmm. owner that wants to, is thinking about starting their or launching their own cookbook. They have aspirations to do so. What would, uh, y- your tip be for like starting the process? My, my, tip, my tip would be to, to find an agent. Okay. Uh, who can, who has good ties to, to publishers that do cookbooks okay. or food related books and the agent has to really believe in what you're doing. Hmm. The agent has to really believe that your uh, story and your food will resonate with the public. Um, Because if she doesn't, then, or if he or she doesn't, then they're not going to pitch it that hard to to publishing houses. So um, you got to have one that has good relationships Hmm. or that is just a feisty person that really believes in what you're doing yeah what's uh i guess what's next for peached are you gonna get a tv show sometime or what i feel like you're heading down that trajectory a tv show yeah uh, i don't know about that <laughs> um you know for the first time in a while i i i don't have anything down the pipeline i really want to give this book mm-hmm. the attention that it deserves because a lot of people spent a lot of time on this book. It is not, you know, I, I clearly spent the most amount of time, but my photographer spent a lot of time on this book. Uh, the publisher, my editor spent so much time on this book, editing my book, three, three to two different editors. Um, the guy who did the layout spent a ton of time laying the book out. The, the salespeople spent so much time selling it. Three sets of PR people, like, if we just don't hustle now and don't promote it and don't shove it in everyone's face, like we've done all that work a disservice. So for me, like my focus is on getting this book out there. Like that's the most important thing for me right now. Otherwise it would have been all kind of a waste, you know, like Mm -hmm. as much as I would love to have a conversation piece at my house and as much as (laughs) it's nice to have something to reflect on, like that was, that was a hell of a lot of work to just have only that. You know, like we need we need it to boost our brand. We need it to raise the level that we're perceived at um, nationally. And then maybe opportunities will come from that and we'll take them, you know. But that that's the goal. The goal is to raise awareness for Pete Pe- Tortilla, make us a national name, um, make us a household name in Austin. And then from there, see what opportunities we can derive and then pursue those opportunities that make sense for us. Why do you want to become a national name? Because I think that's how you survive. Hmm. And I think if you're a national name, your name resonates more locally. Um, hmm. And if you're a national name, you are given opportunities that other people don't get. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those opportunities are pretty good, you know. Um, and an example would be like um, – you look at Las Vegas and you look at like the Cosmopolitan Hotel and you see uh, you see David Chang, Momofuku, you see Milk Bar, you see STK, which is a steakhouse. You see a Jose Andres restaurant in there. You see Egg Slut. Um, you go walk across the Park MGM. You see Best Friend by Roy Choi. These are national names. They get these deals because they're national names. They get these deals because of the press that they've uh, garnered over the years. Um you know, they're in airports, you know, <laughs> they're in different countries. Um, I don't know the economics of those deals, um, but I sure as hell would like to see them. <laughs> and I'd like to, I'd like to know what, what's involved in them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, also, I think it's easier to raise money if you're a national name. I think, I think investors will, not that we have an issue raising money, but I think it's just easier, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I've always said that, like, if you don't put yourself out there, you don't, um, you don't know what will happen. You know, like when you write a book, like the odds of it blowing up are probably not in your favor, you know, but if you don't write your book, you're, you're definitely not going to blow up because there's no book. (laughs) So you have to put yourself out there and hope that good things happen. And that's what we're, that's my, that's always been my attitude is like, let's just put ourselves out there 
we have to give it a shot, you know, like we just have to. Right. I think that falls in line with uh, what I've just kind of observed you doing like over the years, Yeah. Uh, you know, from food trucks to restaurants to bars to, you know, and in big places too, like the Austin airport can't be the cheapest spot to lease out on a monthly basis well, that's, that's, interesting. <laughs> that, uh, that's an interesting story that you brought that up so that's actually a licensed unit so i don't oh, operate it okay those um i have one employee that is now an employee of delaware north so it's a licensed unit oh, and we okay. take a royalty oh nice so that's not like um that's not like we're not going to hmm. retire off that location but when they came to me uh oh you know some people had turned that spot down you know because <laughs> they were worried about um perhaps their brand not, um, being taken care of. Um, okay. And right. for me, like I always saw that as like, it was a little risky in the sense that, you know, I, I, these weren't my employees. Um, but the benefit of it was like, you can't, you can't get that type of marketing and awareness anywhere else. Like there's so many people that come through the Austin airport there's yeah. so many people that see your sign, even if they don't even eat at your damn restaurant. Like they're seeing your brand. Like that's what you pay for in marketing. You pay for impressions. And on top of that, the people that do go and wait in line and do eat the food, if they come away and they like it, then we've just earned a we've just earned a customer. Mm-hmm. You know? And so I always felt like, oh wow, that that's another opportunity where even though we weren't gonna make a ton of money off of it, um, we we were gonna get so much residual benefit from it that it was gonna be worth our while. And so far, that's proven right. You know, we're we're about to hit our year mark there next mm. month. Okay. And while our opening was rocky, I would I would ten out of ten times I would do it again. Okay. Well, I can't wait to eat there. I'm definitely going to check it out when I'm yeah. in Austin. I'm curious what you think of that location versus our other locations. You should definitely check out. If you, I mean, I don't know how long you're here, but you should definitely check out both locations because okay. they're very different. And our Bar Peach location is. It's got a huge patio. It's in like an old bungalow. It's it's a very ambitious project, uh, oh, much bigger than than the other one. Yeah, I'm there for like three or four days. Um, okay. The event I'm going to is at a, I want to say like the Line Hotel. Line. Yeah, the Line. That's the line. another example of what national recognition gets yeah. you because the the restaurant in the Line Hotel in Austin is run and owned by Kristen Kish, who was she won Top Chef. Okay, no kidding. <laughs> so, I mean, that those opportunities don't go don't get to you unless you're like a national name, you know? She's mm-hmm. a celebrity now, so I mean, she gets that deal. Yeah, know? right. Uh, Eric, most of the folks that are listening to this are either going to be owning a food business of some type or want to own a food business of some type. Obviously, you're somebody that's I would say started from basically nothing, grown up pretty substantial regional empire of your own what's the uh i i guess what what is your biggest tip for folks that want to replicate what you've been able to do yeah well i mean i it's it's a long road you know Mm -hmm. like i think you have to bite it off in pieces and i think you can you can be overly ambitious um up front there's nothing wrong with ambition. You should be ambitious. You should be willing to take risks. You should go big. Um, but you need to do it at a pace that makes sense. You know, you have to, if you're someone like myself and you had limited knowledge of what you were getting into, then you should go slower because it takes time to learn. Um, it takes years to really learn. And I still don't know everything I need to know. And I've been doing this for nine years, you know, I'm coming up on a decade. Um, but uh, I think the most important thing is your attitude, uh, beyond that. Um, because there are so many things that, um, there's so many bumps in the road that you're going to hit, um, particularly in food truck business or trailer business, hospitality business, and you have to be willing to get past them. And for the first couple of years, it's just like landmines everywhere. You know, like you're just going to get beaten down. Uh, you're going to hit a lot of bumps. Your, your morale is going to get beaten up and you got to, you got to keep your attitude here, um, which is a lot easier said than done. Right. Uh, I certainly wasn't able to do that for the first three years. I mean, I had some really low points. I struggled a lot with almost to a point where I was 
like wondering if I was suffering from depression because my business wasn't panning out. Um, huge, huge, huge low points. Um, and I think a lot of people go through that and I think they just need to keep steady. Um, and I, I think there's a lot to be said for having balance in the sense, like if you have a disruptive personal life, like it's too mm-hmm. difficult to make it in this business. Like in my opinion, like you have to, you have to have peace outside of your job to be able to function in this industry. Yeah. That uh, I was, I wasn't planning to ask this, but like what, uh, cause I feel like the home life, especially once you get like kids and stuff, it kind of like changes things. Well, it changes things a lot. Um, yeah. especially when you're trying to like build something, uh, like how do how do you make sure that there's a, a good balance of family f- for you? Do you just like yeah. block out time in your schedule each week or how do you approach that? Mm. Obviously, you've got I a mean, really supportive I'm not, partner, I'm, I'm, too. I'm right? actually home. home um, I mean, it just depends, you know. So my, my wife, well, first of all, my wife understands the nature of the business. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, a good example would be like Wednesday night, like we were short staffed in an event. And I called my team and I was like, hey, do you need an extra hand? I'm happy to help out. And I came home at like seven that night and I told my wife, like, I got to change and like go to an event and I I might not be home till like 10 tonight. Mm -hmm. And she understood, like, she understood that like the business is important and Mm -hmm. it's important for the boss to be out there. You know, if there's a problem, like I just have to be, it's my business, you know, pays the bills. Um, and so like on a night like that, I might've seen my kid two minutes. Um, but for the most part, I've been, I have not been in the restaurants as much as I was when we started and not anywhere near when I, when I first started the business, you right. know, like that was like, right. like I would never see my kid if I were working those kind of hours. <laughs> um, right. so I do block off time. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me, honestly, is just kind of being a little bit fatigued, you know, like just having a kid, like, you know, like you don't sleep as well and mm-hmm. You know, seven hours of sleep with a kid is not the same as seven hours of sleep with, with, you know, no, no kids, you know? Um, and so you just kind of deal with it, but it's, it's a tougher, it's a tougher balance. I would never have been able to do this, uh, start this business nine years ago with kids. It's just, it's a non-negotiable. It would never have happened. It couldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. You, the reason why is like now I have good core people that, you know, I can trust that, that work for me, but when you're just starting, like you, you don't have that trust yet. Yep. Awesome. Eric, always appreciate talking to you and yeah, uh, man. getting the opportunity to hear from you. Definitely check out uh, peach tortilla, modern Asian comfort food from Tokyo to Texas. That's right. On Amazon. Comes out um, May 7th, but it's available on pre-order now on Amazon on indie books and on barnesandnobles.com. So you can get it on any three of those right now, but it will be available. It starts shipping on May 7th. And come into his restaurant for a signed copy. Absolutely. (laughs) Here are my three key takeaways from today's interview. If you don't do it, you're never gonna know. You're never gonna find out whether or not that idea that you have in your head is gonna work out. This is something that Eric has followed through and definitely practices what he preaches, whether it's launching a cookbook, You know, he started a bar, an event space, and even opened a restaurant in an airport, which was a thing that a lot of other people do, decided to pass up on because it was too big of a risk. Definitely, Eric has been a risk taker and it has helped his brand move forward in his local area. Number two, this is really, really related to number one. Eric is very, very aggressive with his marketing and he realizes it's something that he's got to do if he wants to take his brand to that next level from a regional player in Austin. He's become very well known, but he wants to go national. And to do that, again, he's taken a lot of risks with his marketing, whether it's taking the time to launch a cookbook, or even if you look at his website at thepeachtortilla.com, you can see that the money and the effort he's invested into things like photography, and design to make his brand really stand out is something that's uh, paid dividends for him. 
Finally, there's gonna be highs and lows to every business, even if you do end up being successful. When you look at Eric's business from a 10 year standpoint, it looks like he came out of nowhere, uh, you know, started as a food truck, now he's a multi-location restaurant owner. But if you look at it from a year to year standpoint, Eric definitely shares that he had lows. He actually thought about quitting his business, giving up on numerous occasions, talks about being depressed even for a certain period of time. Understanding that even if you do ultimately create a successful restaurant, you're gonna have highs and lows along the way and you've gotta find a way to push through those and, and be ready for that challenge that awaits. Thanks for listening to today's interview. And if you want more interviews with food entrepreneurs like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash foodempirepro.